Thank you so much, Ilis, for invitation and uh, nice words. <coughs> so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak about uh, for the this idea of novel architecture for the first time. It's a, it's a book that I'm currently reading actually, uh, and um, it's the first uh, public appearance. Let's say. Uh, so, if it's a bit loose, not completely perfect as a as an intellectual sphere, um, please uh, forgive. <laughs> um, the starting of that book or this idea about marvelous architecture is uh, actually to try to go beyond economy of means and uh, the poetics of reason that that were the themes about which we we worked in. Uh, during the Lisbon Triennale with my colleagues from uh, um, Marna Valley. And uh, it's a way also to state that and to understand in which way architecture is based upon surprise. Uh, a good building is astonishing. Uh, and it's not an easy idea uh, coming from my background because uh, I have a background which is also linked to the city and all those ideas by uh, Rossi about the city uh, that have linked also to a, a look for anonymity in a way. And uh, also to, uh, of course, sometimes very great achievement, but also sometimes a, a certain, um, how can I say, certain project made in, a easy, in an easy way. And also, of course, all the great ideas, once they are diffused everywhere, uh, tends to be uh, some, somehow weaker. And uh, uh, at a certain point, at least in France, but also or, or other places in Europe, uh, if, you, if you made a flat facade with the vertical windows, you would consider that your building was okay in the city. And uh, it's not enough, obviously. Uh, it depends. There are different ways of making, of dealing with conventionality. So actually, I came to the to the conviction that uh, architecture is based upon surprise, and uh, and then all this argument is about the the understanding how architecture that has to last by definition can be based upon surprise. Surprised that, uh, as Auguste Perret, the French master, uh, said, uh, surprise is a non-lasting shock. And of course, uh, it's completely, and it seems contradictory with the issue of lasting long, as a building has to last, because of course, the building lives a long life and they, they need to be interesting, relevant, exciting during their whole life. So it's about this kind of contradiction, how to create lasting surprises in a way. Uh, and um, I can immediately state that rationality and reason will play a central part in this process. And uh, that r reason for architects, of course, and not only for architects. It's not boring, it's not dry, it's really glamorous, it's really hot. And uh, that's all about those issues we, I would like to discuss. So some uh, building surprise. Oh. Some build building surprises. This piece of Gothic architecture in Paris from the 13th century, which used to be a refectory, a place to eat for monks, you see built in 13th century with uh, poles, columns, I don't know, columns stacked on top of each other that are so thin, so slender, actually a, a kind of proportion that you will find Look at this, it's made of stone, but it's as it's perfectly well balanced in terms of uh, forces. And of course the stone is, uh, it's a hard stone, very well chosen, let's say. It can have this proportion and uh, 
we'll have to wait six centuries to see other columns of the same kind of proportion. In the Saint Geneviève Library by Labrouste, which is, by the way, of course, completely inspired by the first building. And uh, uh, Labrouste, of course, that created this space as well for the National Library. Isn't it astonishing? It's super rational in terms of structure, in terms of construction, and Labrouste was a great rationalist. Isn't it the most striking thing that was possible to build uh, at that time? And this one from the 13th century again, Saint Chapelle in Paris. Isn't it uh, astonishing to see such a almost curtain wall uh, made to, to be a kind of jewel box to shelter the, the holy crown of the Christ? Uh, isn't it astonishing to see another glass architecture in England from that you, some of you know where knows well, how do we call in uh, from the end of 16th century, more windows than wall, as it's sometimes said about it, and which is obvious. So the glass architecture is not belonging only to 20th century. And is, it wouldn't have been astonishing such a building, the Dentium by Terani, a space with glass column supporting the sky, in a way, in a tribute to Dante. Isn't it something to see now this column by Bramant in Sant'Ambrogio Cloister in Milano, uh, in a shape of, of, a, of a trunk, of a tree? Of course it's striking. What is striking, of course, as, for us as, as architect, we know that it comes from uh, Vitruvius, and the interpretation of the archaic architecture and the first column being a tree. But what is then incredibly surprising is to see this kind of theory, purely theoretical, uh, purely imaginary um, statement that is suddenly built in the real life. And uh, if we have a look at the end of the, of the perspective, when I walk down this space, who is welcoming at the end of this corridor? That strange guy with his big eyes and small mustache. And Bramant is a serious guy, you know, but also able to deal with this anthropomorphic dimension of architecture, which is ob obviously impossible that it's made by chance. And of course, those big eyes, actually, we will find them out again in an architecture, in a house, it, it, that has been shaved in between uh, in this imaginary house of uh, Monocle in the, by the French uh, filmmaker Tati, of course. And isn't it striking to, to go into this well-known John Stone house and to really experience the feeling of entering into the brain of the architect and to consider this architect that, that, that has decided to spend his whole life in his own brain, to take his brain out of his head to, and to innovate into it. And uh, isn't it strange to see this glass house? The glass house is really something, of course, seemingly stupid, isn't it? It's uh, something uh, so contrary to the idea of domesticity, of protection, of the kind of domestic cocoon. But of course, with the means of 20th century and the imagination as conceptual imagination of Ms. van der Rohe, it turns possible. And um, isn't it strange? On one hand, a, life, a, a house as an aquarium, and then on another one, a, a house with an aquarium on the, on the roof. And uh, that explains the whole project in this Dalava house. And then a house as a stair, a stair going just nowhere with this kind of a Nike whoosh on the, on the roof as well in the Malaparte house. And isn't it strange and so, so astonishing again to see this room 
Le Corbusier built for himself in his mother's house on the, on the shore of the Lemon Lake in Vevey. Uh, and such a bed, which uh, who allowed him to, 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 see, to look at the fantastic scenery of the lake by this very narrow horizontal window. And also this, this desk, of course, as a kind of San Geronimo uh, cabinet. And uh, one can work and one can write books. And, and uh, it's so focused, it's such an image of concentration towards the, the work and the dreamy-like uh, look at the, at, at the lake at the same time. And why all, all, all those buildings are surprising? Uh, actually, they are, sorry, I have a problem. Um, they are first because they are conventional. They are conventional and slightly, they have slightly moved from, from convention, but they are made of brick and mortar walls, uh, in many issues, they are conventional, and what makes them surprising, what makes them interesting and uh, strange is the fact that they are uh, uh, dealing with convention, but shifting from it as well. But, and um, those architectures are, mar are marvelous in a way. We can say they are marvelous. It's really... Uh, when we are in such buildings, we really feel that we are in a in another world, of uh, uh, in a way, but also linked to to the reality, which means that it, it makes the reality stronger, more beautiful, and that's the aim of the architecture, actually. And um, uh, this marvelous dimension, actually, if we look at some guys that have been involved in the marvelous. Uh, if we read uh, Louis Aragon, the French surreal poet, in the Paris Peasant, he explains that the marvelous is the eruption of contradiction within the real. The eruption of contradiction within the real. Uh, of course, it reminds us Robert Venturi as well with his famous complexity and contradiction and the guy that has been so much involved in contradiction but we should decide which kind of contradiction in a way Robert Venturi by the way of course this book uh, complexity and contradiction is really one of the best book ever written about architecture it's so crystal clear about some very difficult issues and some buildings of Venturi are interesting of course and even good but at a certain point he has tried to make buildings with so many contra contradictions and in a way so obvious ones what is an obvious contradiction it's a non-contradiction in the end the contradiction is 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 working only when it's metaphorical or at least in a way or another non-obvious so that's a bit the dead end in which uh, and literality in which uh, venturi finally fell but if we go back to this arago then the eruption of contradiction within the real the contradiction it's of course the surprise what is marvelous is what is ah it was unexpected and the architecture is always unexpected always sometimes it, it's, it's even unexpectedly conventional for instance if you consider the first part of the Roger Diner's work uh, of course it's seemingly conventional seemingly over conventional but as soon as you consider things, the windows are eight meter long, they're made of bronze, the quality of detail is so amazing, then of course it has nothing ordinary, nothing conventional in the, in the end. And, um, um, and of course, 
England has been also a territory in which uh, some people have brought very interesting uh, ideas and, and, and works uh, in the field of convention and the interpretation of convention. Uh, Florian Beigel, uh, uh, Sergison Bates, Tony Fratton, Caruso, all those guys, have, and now they are quite far from, from each other, but at a certain moment, they, their work has explored the same kind of territory. And um, finally, we have a problem with the surprise. Because the surprise, as I already mentioned, doesn't last. And our buildings last. So how to solve this? Uh, probably we could say that some surprises, if they are not linked to convention, if they are not linked to the common culture of the space, if they are not linked to the common culture of architecture, if they are not um, um, created within the boundaries of the architecture as a discipline, then of course those surprises often, they tend to be kind of private jokes. And uh, of course the private jokes have nothing to do with architecture. Architecture is a common culture. It's uh, it's buildings, good buildings are pieces of, of art thrown in the public space. So of course, architecture has to deal with the price and with common culture in a specific way. I do not agree when uh, Adolf Loos says that, says that the work of art does not have to be liked by anybody and the building has to be, but we understand what he means. It's, it's exactly this kind of thing. In details, of course, we can discuss such, such statements, but uh, it creates a frame for thinking a bit. And um, of course, uh, through rationality as well, those surprises can be understandable, intelligible, shareable, and as soon as they are shareable, they, they are able to create this common culture which is our aim as architects to create. The building, the architecture, bring things together, bring society, com uh, social groups together. If you consider the huge trauma unexpected for this social dimension that we really have to address. So the good surprises are not private jokes. What I uh, call a bad surprise, it's this kind of thing, kind of surprise for, for children. This uh, Fondation Vuitton in Paris by Frank Gehry. Uh, and such a building just aim at uh, being out of discipline. It's nothing to do with architecture in a way, uh, except it's a building. Uh, and uh, especially because what makes his expression uh, the cloud, because Gary explained that he wanted to make an iceberg wrapped in a cloud. Yeah, maybe is it poetry? Uh, but it's not, it's not enough to make a building. Because uh, what is that cloud? That cloud is made basically by those surfaces of glass. And those surfaces of glass have absolutely no use in the building. The building is a kind of loose, uh, kind of clumsy uh, stacking of waterproof boxes that shelter and create inside uh, completely conventional museum white boxes. And then added, just for the sake of existing for themselves, this kind of pieces of, of glass. So of course, such a building as, as not the link between necessity and beauty, necessity and expression that is at the core of the architecture. So you can consider in a way or another, but the only thing you can admire in such a building is the supposedly creativity 
of Frank Gehry. And it's probably not enough to make a building and give a meaning to a building. Uh, by the way, it's in the larger park of Paris. It has not any relationship with the park. The only relationship with the park is the little door you can see at the center of the picture. So of course, such a building is on, only based on personal and private obsessions. And of course, uh, obsessions are very, uh, very use, useful for architects. But we have to find a way of crossing our own obsessions with the field of the common culture of the discipline. So such a building is so few link to something, to anything common actually, that once the first time you, you've seen it, once the, the surprise is burned, it won't be interesting any, any, anymore as a, as, a bad, uh, as a bad joke. You know, the first time you laugh a bit, but the 10th time it's kind of pathetic. So such an architecture cannot last because it's not inscribed in a common uh, culture, I would say. So if we turn a bit to Auguste Perret about the surprise, because uh, this guy obsessed by permanence, he has st he stated that surprise is a non-lasting shock. So surprise cannot be involved in architecture. Uh, but uh, Perret is very often badly considered because is especially in France is kind of hated and his, his buildings are transformed in a scandalous way. Uh, they are vandalized almost systematically. It's really something which is a pity. But on another hand, the people interested in Perret usually are a bit nostalgic and uh, let's say, yeah, reactionary. And uh, so he has been uh, in a way instrumentalized and uh, it tends to make forget that is one of the few fathers of modernity, let's say. It's not by chance that Le Corbusier came in Paris to work for him. It's not by chance that uh, Hilbersheimer wrote text uh, passionated texts about him, um, but nowadays is considered as a kind of uh, uh, yeah class supposedly classic architect. But if you consider his work, of course all those works, the Rue Franklin building, the church in Le Rancy, which is this kind of concrete shelter for praying, uh, a revisitation of the Saint Chapelle or uh, the church in uh, Le Havre, or uh, the Musée des Travaux Publics, or any building by Perret is completely astonishing, completely exceptional. But the misunderstanding comes from with this. He who, without betraying neither the modern materials nor modern programs, would have created a work that would seem to have existed forever, that would, in a, in a word, be banal. I say that one could feel content. So he was looking for banality. And banality has been linked to convention. Only to convention, but the people reading this often, they forget those words. Actually, in the French version, it's only used one, but it's the same. Modern. He's interested in modern, being modern, modernity. And uh, the modernity of material and is, is the pioneer of the concrete, of course. And uh, modern programs as well. So actually the banality appears as the possibility of the modernity. Banality is the condition of existence of newness. It's the condition of existence of the surprise we were looking for and of the marvelous character of, of architecture. Banality is not a way of looking behind. It's a way of, of looking um, in front of you 
to, but not to create this kind of new things or surprises that are completely cut in from reality, but it's the way through which one can create um, new things that will land harmoniously in reality, in the re physical reality, in the reality of the discipline as well. So it's a way of inscribing newness in the flux of history through uh, its, in its inscription in the discipline itself. So banality is something that aims at being different, at being surprising, at being new, not something that aims at nostalgia or melancholy or I don't know what kind of a bit depressing feeling. Um, so actually the banality is, it, it measure the distance between convention and, and the newness and it works in order to never create this distance by giving up with the disciplinary, disciplinary culture. So the banality, it's the newness inscribed in the discipline, let's say. And that's exactly what Perret did. I think if you consider, for instance, this building, housing building made of concrete, already a strange plot at the, on three on three sides and uh, with a kind of face very, very much addressing to the city. Of course, the reading of the skeleton on the facade and then those vertical windows, but those vertical windows, they seem conventional, but they are from top, from um, uh, floor to ceiling. They are super big, but they are vertical because as used to separate against Le Corbusier, the window, this is the man, so it's vertical. But strangely, this building with this skeleton readable where, where you can feel the weight of the building going to the ground, then suddenly in this lower part is cut it by a long window. And this long window, it's that one, it's the Perez office itself. He used to work there. It will turn to be the Fernand Pouillon's office later. And so inside this place, the structure is not on the facade, it's those poles inside. And of course it expresses the capacity of the concrete to make a free plan and to make a cantilever and this to, to, to have this setback from the facade and the long window outside what Le Corbusier would name a free facade. And um, look at the size of the poles, they are quite strong, almost not Doric, but yeah, kind of strong. And look at this stair, of course, completely fluid, cantilevering, expressing the specificity of the tectonic of, of concrete. And then in the last floor, the apartment of Perret with those poles, and those, this time those poles are much slender and their proportion and elegance, of course, it expresses the fact that it, they, they support less weight because they are at the last floor but also they are more elegant to match with the, the finely uh, crafted uh, wooden uh, ceiling and so on. They are, so they are more domestic and at the same time the, their dimension is um, decided through the laws of uh, rationality of construction. So everything is uh, marvelous in this building and at the same time completely understandable. So I'm going to show you two quick examples of our buildings in the way we try to work from the, this point of view of, uh, of this. Um, uh, now, before starting, uh, I forget to, to tell you, yeah, what, what, what's at play in such a building and in all those extraordinary buildings we have seen? Um, actually, um, it's possible to explain this building in a rational way. From the structural point of view, the design of the facade, the city, logical, the function, of course, because the, the, the structure allow 
uh, to create great apartments, but also uh, a good uh, office space. So it's logical, it's rational. It's decided, the dimension of many elements are decided through the laws of the construction and the mathematics in a way. And, um, but it's also because this building has created a, a, a very precise narrative that it can be explained and, that, that it's in, and why it's good as well. Because making a project is of course building the building itself, but it's also defining during the process of the project it's defining the rules that will allow us to give a meaning to this building and to define the narrative that will explain the building in a way and that the narrative that will allow us to give it a form that will last and uh, to create this kind of lasting surprises. But it's, it's, it's in that way that rationality is the the stronger uh, drug that can take uh, an architect to to improve his imagination in a way because through the field of rationality we can image in a narrative for the project that will turn irrational things that are irrational decisions that are irrational in themselves they can be turned logical and rational within the limit of this made by purpose narrative and the function of rationality it's not to make dry things in the way of engineers could make for instance but it's the way of justifying irrational decision into a rational narrative in a way this is this tension that is at, at play in the architecture that's why, for instance, it's completely irrational to create such a big window, long window in such a building that, that expresses the weight. But of course, in the narrative of this project, it's completely rational, understandable, and the poetics comes from this reason, this kind of uh, poetic reason, which is at the core of the architecture. And creating a rational building in that way allows us to create lasting surprises because it's not surprises that are just based upon our own creativity but it's uh, surprises that rest upon the laws of the static the laws of the nature the laws of the discipline the culture of the discipline and that can be linked to a more common and shareable experience but nevertheless we never have to we all, we have the responsibility of never boring anything uh, never building anything boring so it has to be shareable it has to deal with the convention but from a distance this distance is fine tuned by banality let's say and the overall poetic is resting upon the reason that allows us to make rational things that are in themselves that would be irrational but they, we, once they are inscribed in the overall structure of our nar narrative they tend to be rational logical and we can then completely take the benefit of something so unexpected but at the same time not stupid let's say so I show you two projects, all projects now actually, but um, I don't have yet uh, material for the, my new buildings actually, so it's not it's not a problem anyway. Uh, a, a building in which the marvelous element, which means the element that makes the that that allows to explain the whole project, is the materiality. And another one, which is linked to the marvelous of typology. So, which means the marvelous element, it's actually, I define this as something in the project, which from which we can explain everything. The, the key point of the project from which we can deconstruct, understand all the decision. Actually, once we are find we have found and defined 
the marvelous element in the project. All the decision can be chained one to each other in a stupidly and brutally uh, logical way. And almost, if possible, with as few arbitrary decisions as possible. We look for anonymity because it's the way of reaching banality, actually. It's, we just want to be, um, let's say, a string on the guitar of uh, architecture, let's say. We don't, we don't want to think to anything. That's the reason why, uh, nevertheless, despite the fact that, okay, we are involved in theory and so on, but at a certain moment when we make project, us as anybody, we got to forget what we know in a way and turn towards intuition. But the intuition of someone with a culture, it's not the same intuition as an analphabet. And it's always this process, we have to forget, go for intuition, then consider what we do in a reflexive way, which is the basis of rationality. And then we convey culture and reason and then start again for intuition. And it's in this kind of balance we can reach the results. So an art center built 10, days, uh, 10, <laughs> 10 years ago or something, in Cherbourg, a city on the channel facing England, in this kind of crappy periphery. Boxes, commercial boxes, McDonald's restaurants, but also on the lower part, <coughs> do you see my mouse here? Yeah, I think you hear it's a, it's a former convent of 18th century. But here, of course, it's the kind of uh, Robert Venturi-like uh, city, right? a small strip seen from uh, the pedestrian point of view, McDonald's and commercial boxes and cars. Then in this environment, we, went, we made a non-choice, uh, at least a non-choice form, a square plan, because a space with no orientation, nothing really to, to grab, uh, to really uh, hold something to, to, to start the project. So we decided, okay, for this square. And then we cut it. We cut it a bit because uh, we wanted to be, to give it kind of orientation or also to make that inside white box neutral, but also with a character. So this wall, the three, this wall is actually a kind of folded wall, which is bigger than the, than the building itself and on which we can make a continuous arrangement of pictures, for instance, because it's dedicated to photography, or we can ignore it as well. So we wanted to make this solid building because it's only a 600 square meter building, so it's the size of a house, so it's very small, but it's at the same time a cultural equipment dedicated to photography once again. So it's a, we had to assume the cultural and public dimension of the project within very small volume. Uh, and we had to be strong to exist in this context. So we made this square, which is, and then we decided we wanted to make solid, solid in a way. So it means <clears throat> that we made no corridor and we decided to cut the volume in two parts, a room, two parts, a room, two parts, a room, two parts, a room. <clears throat> a kind of, systematic way of composing the plant with no corridor, only usable space, packed within very strict boundaries. This is the second level. It's... Then we, contradictory to the plan, we, we brought a pitch roof on this building to, to make it more conventional and seen from the garden here and on the left you see the former convent. It appears as a big house, too big to be a house too monumental in a way. And uh, seen from the street, it's a too small warehouse, <clears throat> too small box along the road. So uh, we, we installed this issue of scale. And also we make the two, two projects actually uh, different. <clears throat> we designed the two facade 
in a separated way. And we, we considered in which way they could gather, and they could gather in that way, and we didn't change anything. It's clumsy, it's not very elegant. It tries to, to keep the ugliness of this kind, but exciting ugliness of this kind of uh, territories, but not by design, designing, designing it in our notebook, but just through the process of creating those two systems of facade without never thinking in which way they could work together. So authentically disconnected in a way. And then we obtain this kind of volume. This is the, the, what you see when you enter. So kind of mute thing that works also with this uh, context. Also this materiality and kind of brutality and uh, uh, clumsiness of the volume, it works also with those old walls and uh, at night, it changes of aspects. There's no Photoshop on all this, it's just real. And inside we have the same material of the street, tar on the ground floor to express the continuity, but also to express it's a public building in which you enter freely, you don't pay nothing and you can, you can see uh, exhibitions. And it works that way. So when you're in the building, you enter in a monolith and you are suddenly uh, being brought in a kind of uh, glass pavilion. So of course it's a kind of special contradiction. And it has to, be, to appear as a something light. You know, in this kind of territory, you, don't, you only have those McDonald's and commercial boxes. They all have a tectonic, which is kind of crappy, but very, very light. You see a bit like America, actually, like uh, ordinary uh, construction, uh, very, very flat, very thin, and very light. And actually, you make this model, which is which there. It's it's on my desk, and you see it had no no cardboard on the bottom. So actually, I could see the continuity on my desk uh, through the model, and uh, you can see the continuity of the floor. Uh, through the th inside the building as well of the ground actually into the floor and uh, it's also work as a small box that we can we just have brought it there and we could remove it easily then too many pictures so actually we, we have designed the project as in order to to make it look exactly as the as the model we took this model which is one to 100 so it's a small model not very detailed, but in the end, we wanted no more details in reality than, in, than on the model. So actually, we didn't make appear the model as the building, but the building as the model more. You see, it's like this, like that. The reality, the model, reality, the model, reality. No water pipes, rain, uh, rain water pipes, and so on. And then the key of the project is this, because we wanted to make it appear solid, but we also wanted to make it appear light. And we wanted to make it appear exceptional because it's a public cultural building, but we wanted it to create a unity with the McDonald's and bad boxes. So create a beautiful building, by dealing with those ugly things. And uh, so we, all this defined a very specific area. And we finally decided to wrap it in this material, which is used usually as waterproof, for waterproofing, uh, garage, flat roofs, or that kind of thing. So actually it's a, it's a material that everybody has in mind, but uh, never anybody consider it positively, because uh, it's really, uh, bad material, let's say. It's just bitumen protected by uh, aluminum uh, foil. But also it was silver, so actually it's shining. It's discreetly installed the building as something dominant in the site due to its cultural and uh, public dimension. But also because silver actually is dedicated to photography those spaces and of course the silver salt are at the core of the argentic photography. So it was interesting us as well to justify this silver through this silver salt. 
And also the silver, it, were, it was linked to many spaces that have fascinated me and that are marvelous spaces. And I wanted to keep this marvelous dimension and bring them into that building. Of course, the factory of Andy Warhol, which is a, a space to make pictures, and also the space in which uh, Velvet Underground, that was so important to me, uh, um, rehearse. And, um, uh, but the main point is this kind of uh, silver space to create images. And then this uh, office of uh, Leverenz, in which you have this silver material on the roof. And uh, this Van Nel factory that is painted since 80 years, regularly it's painted again in this silver painting to the point that now the thickness of painting is so important that seen from, from a close in a close-up, the building seems a bit smooth and uh, not very precise. And of course, it's such a, a fantastic uh, dream, functionalist dream. This building is so literally marvelous that, of course, uh, I was interested in it. And this um, Philips Pavilion by Le Corbusier, also concrete painted uh, silver, and so uh, amazing building as well. And in the end, we made a small monument as a, a Brahman with Tempietto, modestly, I mean. <laughs> but the smallest monument as possible, let's say. It's the, it's the link. I don't mean it's a so important building. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, wrapped in a, in a strange material, as did uh, Meret Oppenheim. And uh, from the meeting of all those intentions was created this building. And... Um, well, I have too many pictures. It's not interesting uh, for what I have to say. And the last example, it's a typological marvelous that time. It's a student housing project in Paris that I show in Architecture Foundation already, but not from that point of view at all. It's this black line, and then all this is uh, buses, public buses for Paris amenities and uh, that we designed as well. So it's a space in which a part of the city in which Perret, Le Corbusier, Malle Stevens, uh, many uh, great modernist architects uh, have built. So it was our imaginary context was, and but of course also physical one was dealing with this. And of course there is also the Swiss Pavilion, which is exactly the same pro the same program, just very near. So kind of challenging. Uh, the same student housing. This is the space in which it will build the boulevard. And then you see on the section, the bus buses amenity, and uh, this is the street level and the housing are above <clears throat> with no relationship almost to the ground floor. So it's a building almost with no ground floor. So these are the industrial parts that we designed very precisely, but which is not the topic of this evening. And the building is basically like this. It's a slab of private spaces, private cells, and in which we have cut it, carved out on each level a double high space, which is a, a lounge dedicated to, the short, uh, to social life. And all those, those spaces we wanted we wanted them to be linked one to each other, so we couldn't stack them. So we brought them just on the diagonal, which is the, the smallest move we, you can make to, to link all of them. And this way we, we have this diagonal of public spaces that goes up to the, to the roof and uh, that links the, the city and that brings the, the intensity of the city into the, to the building. All those spaces are linked by a uh, oblique lift and on the on the garden side you see that each lounge inner lounge is doubled by an outside space which is a kind of, of a patio dedicated to a uh, social life as well you see the system of facade by making this diagonal we make the comp in the composition all the elements are completely linked and interdependent because of course if we change the slope of the of the diagonal it changes all the plan all the dimension so the composition is devilishly uh, interconnected it so it's kind of complex to make it work 
but it, 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 I was interested in this because this interdependence of the elements is a metaphor of uh, the interdependence of vertical and horizontal elements in a concrete structure which exists for the first time in history through the concrete. And this building is made out of raw concrete. So the composition of the overall building is also uh, a metaphor of the materiality of the building. And the key point and the marvelous element of this is this room. Usually those rooms are almost square, but actually, so the, the guys ask us, the client, they ask us a certain amount of, um, of flats calculated from the fact of we had this corridor, they, they had pre, they, they imagined to make a corridor of 100 meter long with two doors on each side actually. But, but actually, and, and this way they define the number of flats, but actually by making much thinner flat in plan and much deeper in the tradition of Le Corbusier, of course, we, we were able to brought 1.5 more uh, rooms per, per level. So in this condition, within the, the, the volumetric possibilities of the urban regulation, we were able to create all those double height uh, spaces, so actually dedicated to social life. So the, the thinness of the plan is the key point of the project. This is the most marvelous uh, thing in the project in a way. So I don't make you any detail. This is a, one of those rooms 2.5 meter, so much larger than the 1.83 of Le Corbusier in La Tourette or in the children uh, bedrooms in Unité d'Habitation Marseille, but nevertheless, it's linked to this, of course, culture of the minimal minimum space. And then you see this concrete structure and concrete facade, and we, you see that we've created those columns actually, because as soon as the the, the, the flat is very narrow and deep. We needed, to, we needed it to have it uh, completely glazed to allow the light to go up to the end of the, of the apartment. But I was, uh, we were a bit scared uh, of, uh, we, want, we wanted to give a domestic feeling to this and we were scared that a flat glazed, glazed facade would have appeared as a kind of office building. So we decided to fold the facade. So this is one side of the fold, the other side of the fold. So this is a flat, this is another flat. So this fold, it creates also a pattern on the facade that creates the, the element of repetition. And this element of repetition, it's double, so it makes appear the facade and the building smaller than, it, than they are, because actually this building is too, too big. For those students, it's a house, and for a house, it's too big. So we wanted to make, the, make, make feel the, the scale smaller and uh, to, to answer to a fire regulation we have to avoid the fire to go from one level to the other, we, we have to, to create this uh, uh, fire screen and we applied systematically the rule of the fire regulation. So it links us to, to take the folding of the facade in plan and to rot it vertically to create those screens and those screens are against the fire, but they also of course convey a, a specific expression to uh, the building, which is a kind of crystalline as the concrete in its micro dimension itself. And then we have to make those poles and to make them uh, more beautiful and also more rational in, the, in their form and uh, to, make sing the, 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 to make sing them as used to separate, we use the same angulation to create those columns four times, you see. And then of course it works in the compression and it's larger at the point of the stronger effort. But at that time, you understand that this one, it's a small one and it has a certain amount of weight. This one, it has a level more, so it needs to be larger. But this one has a level more and it's more than that one. So there is a contradiction in the static way here. So this is, this pole doesn't need to be so large, but it needs to be so large for the sake of being an element at the scale of the overall facade. So it's a column, it's, those are columns actually, by the way, because of course it's always the same form and proportion, but they homothetically 
uh, change in dimension. So it's a kind of totem actually that represent the 400 people living there. And you have to go around it to go into the building. And for us, it, it represented this community and, and convey a feeling of uh, domestic monumentality, let's say. So by many ways, it's exceptional. And by many ways, it's completely conventional, aligned on the street, just a building, uh, one more building in the city. Those are the lounges with the track for the for the lift and all this is concrete poured on sites this is the back with all the patios that you can see and now on this stair we have written the off voice uh, text of uh, chris marker la jete movie for a reason that that i have no time to explain you but basically to convey a complexity that needs, that is needed beyond a certain scale. I'm done, Elis. Good done. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Eric. Um, if the people have questions, then maybe just uh, alert me in the chat box. Uh, let me just, yeah, every, everyone can chat in there publicly. Um, but Eric, maybe I, I could just ask one myself, which is, I mean, you showed so many fantastic buildings and a lot of the ones um, that you were showing in the first part of the lecture were, I guess, buildings distinguished by um, huge levels of technical innovation, that they were, they were uh, buildings of, um, where either through, um, yeah, particularly through material investigations, uh, they 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 re, they achieved a, a sort of um, uh, this sense of the marvelous of astonishment that you were discussing. Also, perhaps in the nineteenth century examples, of course, um, new building types were emerging that they were that, that these the building like the Bruce's Library is clearly a response to. Um, it feels perhaps for the contemporary architect that um, their sphere of innovation has contracted, um, that uh, increasingly the work of the architect is specifying elements out of catalogues that are, uh, um, you know, have been kind of pre-tested and uh, there's, um, and answering briefs that, that are, are, are fundamentally kind of banal in nature. Do you feel that, I mean, where do you feel the, the possibility for the marvelous is now? Uh, if, 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 or do you, do you still think that um, the engineer and you know, the, the te technical innovation and the, in, uh, the innovation of programs still has that potential to, uh, to revivify the, the, the discipline? Um, that's a very good question, of course. That's one of the big issues of the contemporary condition. Um, but I have the feeling, uh, first, that uh, we can, it's very difficult, of course, to, to deal with a building that would be as uh, disrupting as the Labus Library, for instance, nowadays. Uh, yeah, it can be Rolex Center, for instance, but uh, I'm not, which is, of course, a fantastic building. Uh, but uh, I'm more interested in uh, more normal things. I, I, I have to say, uh, for instance, the, the mother, Le Corbusier's mother's house. Uh, for me, it's really one of my favorite buildings, uh, any category, because it's so small. It's so conventional in the way it's built. It's so cheap. It's so normal. And at the same time, so marvelous. And I think we have to find an equation there. Uh, I think that for uh, um, it's more working uh, about the assemblage than of, of course an extraordinary crafting of course the house of john Sohn today it's kind of difficult to achieve uh, but for instance you see here those blue doors in that picture i have 365 flats so with this so one one per day of the year so during the first year of construction we we recorded the the color of the sky in paris and each door as the color of a day. So we have 365 
Of course, the painter company, uh, the guys from the building company, they didn't notice this at the beginning, but it was too late. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's through these kind of things, I think we can, uh, we can really improve and load the project with intentions. And um, um, we can manage marvelous in a, in, a, in a very daily life way, in a way. We don't need to make extraordinary uh, structure or technical things to achieve uh, great things. And uh, I agree, I prepared this a bit, of course, in a hurry. Uh, and you are very right about my examples, but um, I think we can carve out uh, uh, also uh, more conventional, less exceptional, uh, exceptionally built uh, buildings. But of course, the marvelous also, uh, it's, it can be linked to the materiality, it can be linked to the structure and really construction. Uh, it can be linked to typology, as uh, in the last uh, example of mine. It can be linked to the use uh, of history. For instance, you can look at the Villa da Lava as a kind of uh, deconstructed or lobotomized, as we say, his author, uh, Villa Savoie. Uh, a Villa Savoie which is a kind of uh, uh, raped by, by a wall, which is, of course, something almost a blasphemy to, to uh, destroy... Uh, um, um, a free plan masterpiece uh, through a wall, of course, it's a perverse operation. But uh, sometimes the, the, the history is involved in project in a so uh, relevant way uh, that it, it turns to be marvelous. And I think, by the way, that uh, uh, the thinking about the relationship to history is one of the most important thing we have to do nowadays, not to be postmodern. Me, if I, th if I try to think to this marvelous architecture, is to give up with postmodernism. I mean, we can be conventional, we can deal with the past, we can deal with this story, we can deal with the discipline without being so uh, confident just uh, about the fact that we, we will assemble five, uh, five um, references and it will make a project. No, it's not so simple. So I think that the operationality of the history is nowadays one of the great questions. And I wondered if uh, Eric, if um, you showed the Merit Oppenheim, um, the, the the Harry Cup, uh, as as one of the images, and uh, does the the surrealism as a tradition, is that of relevance to the the argument you're making here? Uh, one thinks of that as a a tradition very concerned with the conjunction of the banal and the astonishing. Um, yes. I mean, maybe something like the Villa Dava is perhaps as Close as one gets to, to a, uh, an architecture that tries to engage with with with, uh, with that tradition, but yeah, um, of course uh, it's uh, very important to me surrealism. Uh, I, I make a, a course and a research about this and the link to architecture, and usually uh, to a certain to a certain extent. Uh, uh, surrealism and architecture, it's always uh, Gaudi uh, and uh, Nelson and uh, no, uh, Kisler and uh, you know this kind of very uh, bizarre things. Uh, by the way, Gaudi is not a guy that, that stick uh, um, uh, frogs on facades. Uh, it's uh, especially a great constructor, of course. But uh, um, uh, me, I'm interested in a relationship to surrealism, which is completely at the opposite of those bizarre buildings. I don't trust uh, at all uh, bizarre, I don't know, uh, bizarre, I don't know how you to say in English, the, the, the bizarre, I don't trust it to be, bizarre is not very original, it's just something about which we can say nothing about it, uh, except it's bizarre. That's why strangeness interests me, and strangeness is linked to surrealism. Because the strangeness is uh, a conventionality slightly uh, shifted, like the photographer uh, surrealist, surrealist uh, photographer uh, uh, captured the reality, for instance. And uh, if you see in in movies, if you if you want to make uh, feel the 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 spectator uh, scared, of course the action has to be almost normal. It has to happen in the same uh, in the same living room as the one he, he, in which he's watching the movie. I mean, you you never scared in uh, Star Wars because it's too far from you. But in the Twin Peaks, yes, you are, you are more scared because, of course, it, it looks as your house. So 
maybe what happens there could happen in reality. So I'm interested in strangeness. I think it's one of the main relevant issues and the way of expression for, for the architecture. And of course, uh, this is one concept of which, with which surrealists have, have dealt extensively. Also some uh, issues about the scale, uh, for instance, uh, or uh, also they have worked extensively on analogy, metaphor, and uh, I think all this is also involved in architecture. So I think we have many entries uh, that can bring us, bring us some light about the possibility of maintaining architecture as a relevant, sophisticated cultural media medium in the contemporary in contemporary ordinary condition. Because that's the actually that's the, the aim of all this. The goal is to maintain architecture as the sophisticated sophisticated discipline it has ever been, uh, but with the means of the contemporary condition in which typical is more interesting than unicom and uh, uh, assemblage is more interesting than uh, the super well-crafted objects. <laughs>